you don't need to be anxious about tonight. We, I'll try to keep it interesting, informative, and a little bit funny. But So, as he said, my name's Ian. I, a couple years ago, was standing in Jordan's position, introducing speakers, introducing topics, and ta facilitating this group. So it's great and an honor to actually be back at the group that I founded, or helped found, and see it still going, and seeing it still fill rooms. And it's even more weird when it's for me, but <laughs> thank you all for coming out tonight. So I'm here today to talk about the Big Bang. Um, my background in physics is more applied condensed matter physics, doing lots of industry type projects, so the number of courses I've actually taken on Big Bang cosmology isn't very high, but I know the rough physics of it. There's lots of physicists in the room today, so when I say things that are wrong, I'm sure they'll call me out on it and we can turn to their collective knowledge. So my topic today is specifically the Big Bang in 90 seconds, or how to give evidence of the Big Bang in an elevator speech. And so this talk is more about, I think the real concept I want you to take from tonight's talk is science communication and communicating ideas. So rather than memorizing everything I say or trying to like condense everything I say, get the background on the kind of ideas you have, the science, the evidence around the world and reformulate it. So my talk is going to be structured like that. I'm going to tell you about the Big Bang, what it is, why it's cool. Then I'm going to tell you some of the arguments for it, sort of what's the evidence, why do we think this happened? You know, it's such a revolutionary idea that the universe just went pop into existence. Why do, why do we think that happened? So I'll give you the evidence and then I'll try and condense that evidence into 90 seconds so you can see how I would sort of formulate it. Don't try to just copy my words, that won't probably work for most of you, but take the time, do the readings about this topic, about evolution, about why you think there is no God. I'm just going to assume you're all atheists here, I know you aren't, but I will just keep assuming it and I'll just make blasphemous jokes all night. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. 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 Lamarill. Thank you for the introduction. So, you get into an elevator, doors close, the other person looks at you and says, a big bang, that didn't happen. And you're just like, oh god, now what? Or oh goodness. <coughs> you have until the sixth floor, because you are too lazy to take the stairs, to try to defend yourself, try to defend your views. So you have nine steps, you know, that very quick elevator pitch. Why do, you, why do you hold your views? Why do you think the big bang happened? So let's go into it. We're going to talk about the Big Bang, not this Big Bang Theory. <laughs> this Big Bang Theory. So the idea, not, the Big Bang Theory isn't a theory about before this point. It doesn't have much to say. Just like evolution doesn't really have much to say specifically on where life came from, the Big Bang, the theory of the Big Bang doesn't really tell us what happened before nothing, or before the uh, quantum fluctuations. There's lots of theories. I recommend you listen to lots and lots of Lawrence Krauss and Victor Stanger and a few other really well thought out physicists who are very approachable in their explanations. The Universe from Nothing is a great talk and book to pick up. So the Big Bang deals with going forward. We start out with the universe at a point, it explodes and hits inflation, finally things cool down, galaxies form, and then eventually we pop into existence somewhere at that end. Big Bang Theory has to do a lot with general relativity. General relativity comes from Albert Einstein, and his general theory of relativity tells us space can have different curvatures. Gravity curves space, and the universe, if we take this three-dimensional universe and picture it as a two-dimensional universe, because it's hard to picture three dimensions bent, so we picture two dimensions bent and then pretend that it's the same thing. The universe could be in one of three configurations. It could be closed, it could be open, or it could be flat. Those are basically the only three ways. It's either really close to one or the other way. Um, turns out we live in a flat universe, so I'll just give you the answer before without doing any of the work because that's kind of the way I like to do physics. <laughs> flat universe is nice from an atheistic point of view because things balance out. It turns out that in a flat universe, the amount of matter that pushes out equals the amount of gravity pulling in. So you have this perfect balance, and the total energy of the universe is nothing. Um, so in 
you get asked, why is there something rather than nothing, you can say, well, it's pretty much nothing anyway. You know, everything balances out and cancels. So it gives this sort of convenient uh, balance. Lawrence Krauss really likes it. And the way he talks about it is physicists already knew this was true, and that's why we had to find there was a flat universe. But we know there's a flat universe for a couple different reasons. So let's go back to the picture. How do you, first, how do you even know what the curvature of space is? You'll notice on here there's triangles. Um, you draw a triangle on a piece of paper, what do the angles add up to? Anyone? 180 degrees, wow. Ask this to a non-like university crowd, a little bit longer to get that answer, or you'll get 90 or other things. But it turns out if you draw a piece of, draw a triangle on a sphere, you can draw a triangle with three 90 degree angles, or with different angles, and get the angles of a tr inside of a triangle equaling more than 180 degrees. You draw a triangle on an uh, open universe, and you can get the opposite. You can get angles smaller, but it still forms a triangle. So to measure our universe, we just need a really big triangle, and we see if that triangle, the angles add up to 180, more or less. And how we measured that, we have to use the cosmic microwave background, and I'll get into that a bit later. But we managed to measure the biggest triangle we could, which is about the si half the size of the visible universe. And it turns out it's 180 degrees. We can also just weigh the universe to measure the curvature. <laughs> I'll leave you with that. So, it's not that hard, come on people. You just look at everything and just say that's what's out there. It just weighs a certain amount. You can measure how much gravity there is. So what? This also tells us, what these different universe tells us, is how the universe will end. A closed universe, it turns out, will go crunch. Everything starts expanding, but there's so much gravity, it pulls it back in, and everything collapses. Uh, this was sort of a nice idea before we actually managed to measure it, because you could have a cyclical universe. So the universe goes big bang, and then it collapses, and it just sort of bounces. But that's not how the universe works. You could have an open universe where things start spreading apart, but they just keep spreading apart faster and faster and faster, and eventually everything just disappears. And that's also not the universe we live in, not an open one. And the idea of a flat universe is that eventually the expansion of the universe will slow down to a stop, so at infinite time nothing's moving away from each other anymore. Now, the weird thing that it turns out is that our universe is going to whimper out and everything is going to move away faster and faster and faster. Lawrence Krauss likes to describe this as our miserable future because about a trillion years from now, all the other galaxies will be moving away from us at faster than the speed of light, which, yes, nothing can move faster than the speed of light, but the cheat is when space expands faster. So it's not that galaxies are moving, it's that space is expanding between galaxies. So what does it mean if things, everything in the universe except our galaxy is moving away faster than the speed of light? It means the sky gets really dark. It means all we can see is the stars in our galaxy and our local cluster, but beyond that, eventually we lose all evidence of the Big Bang. So everything I tell you tonight will disappear and observational science will not be able to find in about a trillion years. So, look forward to that. <laughs> that re the reason the universe is expanding faster and faster is because of something called dark energy. I put up a black slide, be not just because it's dark, but because that's what we know about dark energy. <laughs> so, how do we know this Big Bang thing happened? How do we know in the past the universe was smaller? And how do we, why do we think this is a good theory in physics? Why do we think it's sort of the evolution of physics? Sort of, they say nothing in biology makes sense without evolution. Well, nothing in physics really makes sense without Big Bang theory in the same way. So I have five major arguments that I shamelessly stole from top origins. Uh, first, the redshift of the stars. Second, most of the stuff in the universe is light. And I don't mean like light shining from the projector, I mean just it's not very heavy. Third, the cosmic microwave background, which is really cool. Four, everything is really young. And the evolution of galaxies. So let's get started. The Doppler shift is this idea that if a car is or something is approaching you making a sound, it sounds higher pitched, and as it moves away, it sounds lower. So you hear that as a car goes by. In the Big Bang Theory show, when Halloween Sheldon dresses up as the Doppler shift with little lines drawn like this, and he just goes to everyone, 
and no one can get his costume except the other nerds. <laughs> it turns out that sound isn't the only thing that does this. If you have a light bulb or a star that's moving away from you at closer to the speed of light, it will also do this. So what does the shift, what does the shift look like? As a star moves away from you, the frequency spreads out so it gets more blue or sorry, more red. If it's moving towards you, it gets more blue as the frequency goes up. So if we look out at the universe, every star looks more red than it should. And why don't we just think stars look like that? Well, we know what the basic processes of star burning is, what stars are made of and how they burn and what colors they should burn. And it turns out they're shifted to the red spectrum. So everything in the universe is moving away from us. But it's not just that. It's that things that are further away are moving even faster. So not only is the universe all moving away from us, but things moving, something that's two light years away is moving twice as fast as something one light year away. Now this should raise two questions on this graph, at least if you're a good skeptic. One, how do we know how far stars are away? We don't have rulers, we don't have measuring tapes, we can't just fly there and time how long it takes to get there. And what it comes down to is something called a standard candle. We have a way, we know that supernovas explode at a certain brightness, and stars are generally in certain classes, and we know how bright things are. So it's sort of like if you know you have a 60 watt light bulb, then you know exactly how bright it should look if it's here, or if it's on the other side of the room. So if we have a supernova, and the thing about supernovas is you don't think they're very common, but there's billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies, so they're all the time. So we just look for these standard candles, and we can tell how far each of these galaxies is away by how bright they are. It's not that, not that difficult. So we have a measuring stick. Second, if everything is moving away from us, and the stuff that's moving away from us even faster, the second question you should have is, doesn't that mean we're the center of the universe and Copernicus was wrong? And maybe <laughs> Lamarow was right, we are the center of everything. <laughs> And that's what you, you would see. If everything was moving away from you, things moving, things farther away would move faster and faster and things closer. But it's sort of a trick of our frame of reference. So imagine we're in that middle planet, middle galaxy, and we look and we're moved to here and things keep moving away from us. Well, let's change our point of view over to this galaxy. Now, it looks like everything's moving away from that galaxy. And you can change that frame of reference in three dimensions and see that in an expanding universe where the space between everything is expanding uniformly, it will always look like everything is moving away from you. You know, it's sort of like if you sat on a balloon on any point and blew it up, every other point of the balloon is moving away from you, and every other point is moving away from every other point, and points farther away are moving faster from every point. So it's one of those things that's not intuitive, but if you scratch your head enough, maybe you can accept that it's true. Second, most stuff is light. So it turns out in the Big Bang model, the universe should, the Big Bang should just generally generate hydrogen and helium in that intense first seconds of fusion of the universe. Most of the elements that could, should come out in the deep models of the Big Bang should be hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. When we look at the universe, um, the bigger elements that we do see, uh, we learn from Carl Sagan, we are star stuff. Every element above lithium is pretty much forged in the supernova explosions of stars. So you start with just hydrogen and helium at the Big Bang, and then as fusion takes place and as supernovas superforce uh, atoms together, you get heavier and heavier atoms. So you start with very little stuff, and then you start getting carbon. So if the Big Bang is correct, we should see lots of hydrogen, lots of helium, and then less of the heavier stuff, because there's only been so many supernovas in 13.7 billion years. But if, say, the universe was eternal and everlasting, we should see lots of everything, because it would always be generating um, stuff. And it turns out we see exactly the amounts of uh, elements that we would expect if the Big Bang was correct. We see lots of hydrogen, 70, almost 75% of the, uh, the matter, lots of helium, tiny bit of oxygen, and then some other stuff. 
So all the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and the bigger elements, gold. That's why gold's so expensive. <laughs> Third argument is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I showed that first picture of the Big Bang when it was really hot. At the start of the Big Bang, it was so hot and so dense that you know it's not just global warming hot. It's, we're talking hotter than the sun. We're talking so hot and dense, matter can't exist. You know, electrons and the nucleus are physically separated because there's so much energy going on. And so light can't travel in the early universe. But as the universe expands, it cools down. Um, as it cools down, eventually atoms collapse and light can escape. That's one of the pr big predictions of the Big Bang, is that there, at some point, light escapes. And from that point on, we will, light exists. So it's, light didn't exist, and then God said there was light. <laughs> Bad reading of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, if that light escapes, it turns out that light will just look like the light off a light bulb, black body radiation, which is really just static. So if you look at a channel, if you don't have cable like me, and you switch to a non-digital channel, you'll get a tiny little bit of black body radiation from the start of the universe in your TV. And how we actually found this was really cool. There was a few um, engineers at Bell Labs who were trying to do really precise radio telescope measurements and they kept finding some noise on their signal. And so they went out and they looked at their big antenna arrays, there was bird poop all over them and pigeons had been flying around, so they cleaned all that off, scared all the pigeons away, and they still found this noise, and you know, they waited for the trains to stop and stop traffic for a while. And there was always a little bit of noise, and it turns out that noise is exactly what you would predict from the Big Bang. So as we do better and better measurements, here's frequency, so just sort of color of light, and here's how much there is. Um, anyone who's done a bit of physics will know this curve from any black body radiation. Now, the start of the universe was really hot, so we would expect that to be really hot radiation, except that was a long time ago. The universe expanded a lot, and it got redshifted all the way down to 2.725 Kelvin, so two degrees above absolute zero. Um, and then we can measure it. We can put satellites, erase all of, look between all of the stars and galaxies, and measure exactly what's out there. So that was an early image. We did another one. We ran satellites around Antarctica and looked at it. And I even put it on my coffee mug because it's one of the coolest graphs in physics. Because what this gra uh, graph tells us is this is a picture of the baby universe. As the universe cools down, these little clumps are just variations in the heat of the universe. So the bigger clumps start to form together and make galaxies, and the cooler got cooler bumps. Cooler clumps are empty, and so gravity works on a certain range. Now remember I talked about measuring triangles of the universe. So how we did that is we have a prediction that we know gravity can only travel at the speed of light. So the largest clump that should be able to form galaxies is a standard length on this. We can say it's one degree apart. So any if there were clumps bigger than one degree, they would rip apart and not be able to form galaxies. If there were clumps smaller than that, they could pull more in. So the prediction would be that this picture should have clumps of about one degree. And if, if they're different, that means light is being lensed by the shape of the universe. So this is really tricky to think of, but it's sort of like when you look through a lens and stuff gets bigger, it would be the universe doing that to the clumps either making them bigger or smaller. So if they're a different size, we know our triangle isn't straight. But it turns out when we measure what is the size of those clumps, it fits perfectly with both a flat universe and a big prediction of the Big Bang. So I don't want to actually explain what's going on here other than to say the red line is what science predicts. The little dots and their error bars show you how well we predicted it. and that is potentially more cool than the other graph, but it's less understandable. Everything is young. This is probably the easiest argument to make. The biggest prediction you would think of if the universe is 13.7 billion years is that nothing should be older than that. 
if we look at a star and discover it's been burning for 100 billion years, that would be a rabbit in the Precambrian. You know, that would be something that just doesn't fit with, with the Big Bang theory. You know, we don't expect certain fossils and certain strata in the historic picture, and so we shouldn't expect really old galaxies or anything out of place. And so when we look around the gap, look around the universe and measure the ages of stars, the oldest stars we found are 14.7 billion years. Well, I said the universe was 13.7 billion years, so you might think this is bad, but we have this nice big error bar. <laughs> which you'll get because our estimates of the age of stars are based on what we think that specific star is made of and how long it's been burning. So, and also how far it is away, because if we get any of those numbers a little bit wrong, there's a big error bar. If that number was 30, 40, 50 billion years, a trillion years, we'd be in trouble. We'd have something really off in the universe, either the universe was too young or the star is too old. But it's consistent. Consistent enough for physics. <laughs> Finally, the evolution of galaxies. One of the predictions of this picture is that galaxies should start young and get older. So remember, these, in the Big Bang, it's mostly hydrogen and helium. Well, in stars, those burn really hot, really fast. So think of this as sort of an adolescent teenage, maybe even freshman year when they're full of hormones and really excited. They burn out really fast and really hot. But as it cools down, as we get heavier and heavier elements that take longer and longer to burn, we see more galaxies like that. So if we look through our telescopes backwards, and it's really easy to look in time. You know, we have the perfect time machine of just a giant galaxy. If we look at something here, it's you know, 5 billion years ago. If we look at something here, it's 13 billion years ago. So as we look back in time, we find the galaxies match up with when they should be. We don't tend to see young galaxies now, and we don't tend to see old galaxies in the past. So that's all my arguments. Um, I'm just going to go back so that timer starts again. I will give you the 90 second version of the last 20 minutes now. So why do you say there's no Big Bang Theory? I have five good arguments for you. First, everything's moving away from us. We look at all of the stars, they're all red shifted. They're all Doppler shifted away from us. Galaxies are moving away, stars are moving away. This means in the past everything was tighter together, closer together. This is well established. Most stuff is light. <coughs> Excuse me. The elements that we measure are consistent with the prediction of the Big Bang. If there was more heavy elements, we might think the universe was eternal, but there hasn't been enough time since the Big Bang to create the heavier elements in supernovas and so forth. If one of the biggest predictions of the Big Bang is that there should be a universal light shield at the edge of our observable limit. Just once the universe cooled, light could exist. We look and we see that shield, and it fits our predictions perfectly. Uh, another prediction is that everything should be younger than the Big Bang. The oldest thing we've measured is within the error of the age of the universe. And finally, when we look when we model the Big Bang, we expect hot, violent stars that live sh for short periods to exist long ago, and we expect more mature galaxies to exist now, and that's exactly what we see. So we have five or more well-established arguments in 80 seconds. <laughs> so the moral of today's story is just keep it simple, skeptics. You know, Make your communication nice and straightforward. It takes time to read. I mean, you can't just, don't just try to repeat what I just said because it was probably sloppy and poorly done. And it always works better when you start to think about these issues. You don't have to get a master's in physics or three degrees or three PhDs to try to explain this. But do some of the reading. Watch YouTube videos, read some books, and just sort of get the picture, you know, learning never really hurt anyone, as far as I know. Um, so just do lots of reading. And then, don't just take information in, but try to relay it, you know. Try writing a blog about why you think this, or just write a note to yourself about what your view of the world is. Try talking about it with friends, just do like informal little presentations. It sounds really nerdy. 
um, but it's fun. <laughs> or just get into debates and you know have civil arguments with people where you try to flush out ideas and see what you can come up with. Um, so that's my talk. I took these arguments from Talk Origins, which is a fantastic archive of how to respond to creationists, basically, whether they're young Earth, old Earth, non-Big Bang. Most of this was from the Astronomy Big Bang page, but they have tons of articles on physics, tons of articles on evolution. It's all there. And so if they come to you and say, well, the sun is shrinking at this rate, so it couldn't be more than this old because we could just extrapolate and five billion years ago the earth would be inside the sun. And this is a legitimate argument someone gave me that they saw some paper that the sun was shrinking. And so in the past the earth must have been inside the sun. Go to this website, they have why it's wrong. <laughs> Thank you. And I will answer as many questions or field them to the other physicists in the room. <laughs>